The Gospel of John shares a notable narrative resemblance with Euripides' play The Bacchae. In both stories, the central character is a deity who assumes human form, lives among humans, and faces rejection from his own community. This conflict forms the core of both narratives, yet they diverge greatly in their conclusions. Bacchae ends tragically, leaving its main characters either deceased or shattered, ultimately leading to the collapse of the Theban royal family. In a poignant finale, King Cadmus, initially shown as devout for his faith in God, confronts Dionysus, critiquing the godlike wrath by stating, it is not right that gods resemble mortals in their outrages. This challenges the righteousness of Dionysus's retribution. Conversely, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, portrayed as God incarnate, does not seek vengeance but offers eternal life, setting up a stark contrast to Euripides' violent Dionysus with Jesus depicted as benevolent world savior. These parallels are primarily found in the original version of the Gospel of John. Subsequent versions by later authors don't expand on the Dionysian aspects, suggesting that the likeness to Dionysus are specific to the first version penned by the Johannine evangelists. Various academics have explored the similarities between John's Gospel and Euripides' Bacchae, though there's no consensus on direct imitation between the two works. John might not have intentionally recrafted the Bacchae, but my contention is that he subconsciously selected the tragic mythological framework while reshaping his narrative about Jesus making the resemblances to the Euripides tale about Dionysus somewhat unavoidable. At this point, it's crucial to clarify that I am not suggesting John's writings were directly influenced by Euripides in a literary sense. Harvard professor Dennis R. MacDonald, in two peer-reviewed books, The Gospels and Homer, Imitations of Greek Epic and Mark and Luke X, and Luke and Virgil, Imitations of Classical Greek Literature, Professor MacDonald employed a methodology that has come down to be known as mimesis criticism. His work utilizes these analytical criteria to show the similarities between John and the Bacchae. Dr. MacDonald illustrates that the Johannine evangelists not only emulated Euripides, but also also anticipated his audience to regard Jesus as superior to Dionysus. Professor Carl A. P. Rupp, also a classical philologist from Harvard, has written extensively on the Dionysian roots of Christianity, in particular the Eucharist. The Road to Eleusis is a classic book that was criticized heavily by lazy academics who were not immersed in the material, but his work was later vindicated as the years went by. He shows the Eucharist rituals of the Dionysian religion is practiced by the early Christians. The heresiologist Hippolytus even discusses earlier sects of Christians performing Eucharistic rituals involving hallucinogens and making purple wine. This caused magic visions and the Holy Spirit to take over the initiates of Christ. Regardless of how the later church viewed these rites, heresy or not, they admittedly were done by high-level ranking Christian bishops in Rome, and these groups were extremely popular and had huge followings. The Nicenes, Valentinians, Carpocratians, who had titles of Magus, and synced Jesus with Dionysus, as well as Attis, Adonis, Osiris, and others. Many academics will write these Christians off as heretics who somehow don't count, without realizing that they themselves are being bound by the dogmas of the later Middle Ages Orthodox Church, who try to distance themselves from their own past. The so-called heretics and Gnostics who performed these rites and made these connections between Jesus and the Dionysian were closer to Jesus than the church under Constantine was. Even Justin Martyr, the face of proto-orthodoxy, in his apology, continually compares Jesus to Dionysus, who he admits is the resurrected son of God, to Mercury, who he admits is called the Logos of God, to Hercules, who he says was the son of God whose passion saved the world, and Asclepius, the son of God who raised the dead, as well as Mithras, the son of God who gave Eucharist and ritual salvation. Even Paul himself wrote in his letters that sacrificing to other gods is permitted because he knew that these are the cults that the message of Christ would thrive under. 
the ways in which the fourth gospel of John, the most Gnostic leaning of all the four main gospels, diverges from the three synoptic gospels can be understood through its imitations of the Bacchae. Mark's narrative centers on the revelation of the messianic secret. Matthew constructs this story around the Jewish traditions, continuation, and Jesus' new revelation. And Luke highlights the birth of a new religious movement and its global spread. In contrast, the author of the first Johannine Gospel shapes his story with a clear emphasis on Jesus' divine origins and the resulting dichotomy between the acceptance and rejection of his openly declared divine nature. This narrative approach shows parallels to Euripides' portrayal of Dionysus. The fourth gospel begins by identifying its protagonist as God. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was divine. This one at the beginning was with God. Like John's gospel, the Bacchae begins with the God declaring his identity the Son of God has come into the world to the Thebans. Dionysus, whom Semele, daughter of Cadmus, once bore, induced to do so by a lightning bolt, after having changed himself into human form from that of a god. Not only do these introductions to these tragedies introduce the Son of God, but they also highlight the oneness of both the Son of God with God. The Logos is with God, but also the Bacchae makes it clear that Dionysus is entering the world into the flesh like the Logos and leaving the bosom of the Father. Once again, we can see what Clement of Alexandria meant in his Protrepticus when he says, God in the bosom is a countersign to Sabasius. To show you what he means, Sabasius is the godhead of Zeus and Dionysus together as one. As Zeus sows the heart of Zagreus into his thigh and gives birth to Dionysus. Dionysus in the thigh of Zeus is what the Orphics call Sabasius. To prove this claim, let's examine the Orphic hymn to Sabasius. To Sabasius, fumigation from aromatics. Hear me, illustrious father, Daemon famed, great Saturn's offspring, Sabasius named, inserting Bacchus, bearer of the vine, and founding God within thy thigh divine, that when mature the Dionysian god must burst the bands of his concealed abode. Sabasius is called the son of Kronos or Saturn, which is usually Zeus, Hades, or Poseidon. Here, Dionysus and Zeus are one, both son of Kronos, both being brought into the world. The Logos from John was originally a title of Zeus, son of Kronos, was given by the Stoics as the noose or mind of God, incorporeal, immaterial Zeus, in a different sense than Mercury, who was also given the title of Logos by the Hermetic cult in Egypt for being Zeus's messenger or angel, Angelos. Philo of Alexandria, who is contemporary with Jesus and Paul, as well as being a supporter of Caesar Augustus, although not a fan of Caligula, said this in his On Creation. The corporeal world was then completed, having its seat in the divine logos, and the physical world, perceptible to the senses, was made on the model of it. And the first portion of it, the most excellent of all, made by the Demiurge, was heaven, which he truly called the firmament, as being corporal. For the body is by nature firm, insomuch as it is divisible by three parts, corporal, incorporeal, and spiritual. Here we see Philo employ a Platonic, arguably proto-Trinitarian view of God, creating the world through his logos that goes from immaterial spirit to material matter. This is how Jesus is introduced into the Gospel of John, but this is also exactly how Dionysus, or Sabasius, is presented in the Bacchae and Orphic hymns as being one with the God who stands outside of space and time, who creates his son from himself, gives birth to himself, places his spirit into the body of a mortal woman. Clement's citation of God in the bosom of the Father is a countersign to the adepts of Sabasius can be directly found in John's Gospel, Dionysian Gospel, as John 1.18 states, No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. Some have even translated this to say, in the lap of the Father, which is even more akin to the image of Dionysus in the thigh of Zeus. As Dennis MacDonald points out in his peer-reviewed book, The Dionysian Gospel, the sequence of events in which these characters are introduced are nearly identical. 
with each analogous to each other, operating with similar purposes in the plot. Dionysus entering the world, taking on flesh after being one with the Father, just as Jesus the Logos enters the world as flesh after being one with the Father. Cadmus is introduced by Euripides and praised as a forerunner, someone who is described with clustering foliage of the grapevine, but not Dionysus, who is the vine god. In a very eerie similar fashion, John introduces John the Baptist as not the light, but the one to testify to the true light. The crowds in the gospel, like the chorus of satyrs and maenads in the Bacchae, jumping in from time to time to chant the Theban women in the Bacchae who believe in Dionysus and accept him, even as a mysterious stranger, like the Samaritan woman who accepts Jesus and believes in him. Blind seer, Tiresias, who is given the power of sight in the form of prophecy from the god Dionysus, who he praises, just as the blind man in the gospel is given sight from Jesus in a literal sense and praises Jesus. King Cadmus, who halfway believes in Dionysus, but has some doubts, just as Nicodemus is portrayed in the Gospel. And of course, the most obvious parallel is Pentheus, the prince, who is also the religious authority of Thebes, and is the main opposition to Dionysus and his religious movement, just as we see the Pharisees, the religious authority in Israel, who oppose Jesus and his movement. The assistance of Pentheus, who are ordered to arrest Dionysus, but find no fault in him, just as Pilate is to arrest Jesus, but finds no fault in him. Finally, the twist, because Pentheus is who was killed at the end, not Dionysus, who was already resurrected, but Pentheus is placed on top of a tree and ripped apart by the Maenads, one of them being his own mother, possessed by Dionysus, and she repents after she comes and realizes that her son is dead. Jesus, who was crucified, is visited by his mother, who weeps over her dying son. Dionysus is disguised as a mortal, coming to enact justice on Thebes, and revealed to be divine, is analogous to Jesus, not revealing his true nature until his resurrection. Both Dionysus and Jesus are not received by their home nations, but both end up in triumph for witnesses to believe in after. The sequence of events is on point, and the Gospel of John is following the mimesis of tragedy laid down by Euripides Bacchae. A similar argument is made by Dr. John Moles in his peer-reviewed article, Jesus and Dionysus in the Acts of the Apostles in Early Christianity, laying out the broad thematic parallels between Acts and the Bacchae, including disruptive impact of a new god, judicial proceedings against new god and his followers, bondage of new god and his followers, imprisonment of new god's followers, their generally miraculous escapes from prison, divine epiphanies, more on this argument later. Professor Harold W. Atridge suggests that the quasi-poetic form of John's prologue is not a secondary and casual addition to the gospel. It belongs where it sits at the beginning of the complex gospel. Unlike any other gospels, the fourth gospel John begins as a drama. If one wants to understand the narrative rhetoric of the gospel, it is important to attend to the drama of the gospel. Many scholars have noticed the tragedy, poetic style of John's gospel. We also know that the Hellenistic and Byzantine Roman education systems taught people to read and write Greek by copying the classics, such as Homer and Euripides. It is not far-fetched in any stretch to suggest that the author of St. John's Gospel was using the Bacchae as a template to construct his own gospel tragedy. Clement of Alexandria noticed these parallels and wrote about them. The difference are what matters the most, not the similarities, which is the sequence and imagery. But Jesus is an anti-Dionysus, and Dionysus is an antichrist. To go back to Clement of Alexandria, he lays this out for me perfectly as he describes describes the mystery of Christ using Bacchic imagery in Protrepticus. Come, O madman, not propped up by a thrysis, not wreathed with ivy, throw off your headband, throw off your fawn skin, get sober. I will show you the logos and the mysteries of the logos, and I will describe them with your own imagery. This mountain is beloved of God, and it's subject to tragedies like Kitharion. Bacchic mountain prominent in the Bacchae, but exalted by dramas of truth, a sober mountain and shaded by chaste woods. 
reveling here are no maenads, daughters of thunder-stricken Semele, initiates in the disgusting distribution of raw flesh. Instead, they are daughters of God, the beautiful lambs who utter the solemn rites of the Logos and gather together a sober chorus. This chorus consists of the righteous, and their song is a hymn to the king of all. Young girls pluck their instruments, angels sing praises, prophets speak, the sound of music carries. Quickly they follow the Theosos, those who were called Skorioth, longing to welcome the Father. It's interesting that Clement uses the imagery of distributing raw flesh as the initiates of Bacchus, when in a spiritual sense, the initiates of Jesus Christ also eat the flesh of Christ in the Eucharist. Later in the same book, Clement calls Christ a new Orpheus, singing the song of salvation, invoking the same Bacchic Orphic imagery laid down throughout this video. Orpheus was the theologian, Theos Logos, etymologically breaking down into God's word, and Orpheus was the revealer, or the apocalypse, of prophetic wisdom given by Dionysus and Apollo, who he was high priest and son of. Jesus, like Orpheus, reveals a new apocalypse for a new world, who he is high priest and son of this god, the god Theos. And both Jesus and Orpheus sing hymns as they die. Jesus is reciting psalms on the cross, and Orpheus is chanting Orphic hymns as he is torn apart by the Maenads in the river Hebrus. According to the church tradition of Catholicism and Orthodoxy, there are three events that are said to have taken place on the same day but in different years. The first event being the birth of Christ, also known as the Epiphany, in which the three Magi visit the newborn child in the Manger. The early church, corroborated by the earliest sources, indicates that they believe this took place on January 6th, 12 days after the winter solstice, hence the 12 days of Christmas. Epiphanius of Salamis reports that this was the day Christ was born, at the same time as other predating pagan festivals. Christ was born on the sixth day of January, after 13 days of the winter solstice, and of the light and day of addition. But this day is celebrated by the Greeks and also by the pagans on the 6th of January, called by the Roman Saturnalia, and by the Egyptians Cronia, and by the Alexandria Cicelia. According to multiple sources, the Alexandrian church was the first to venerate the birth of Christ on this day, and this was started by the Basilideans, a Gnostic sect from Alexandria from the late 1st early 2nd century. 30 years later, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist on this exact same day of January 6th, according to the church, and the same Basilideans asserted that the Feast of the Epiphany was to be celebrated on the same day. But the followers of the early Christian Gnostic Basilides celebrate the day of his baptism too, spending the previous night in readings, and they say that it was on the 15th of Tybi, January 6th, of the 15th year of Tiberius. The baptism of Christ, along with the birth of Christ, are two of the three events that are celebrated at the Feast of the Epiphany on January 6th. The third event is an odd one. The church asserts that the wedding at Cana, when Jesus turns water into wine, also occurred on January 6th and was also venerated at this Feast of the Epiphany, possibly due to this being the first miracle that occurs in the Gospel of John. But I think there could also be a Dionysian layer to this. In that same passage from Epiphanius about Christ being born on January 6th, he goes on to say something that is truly remarkable for this discussion. They answer and say that at this hour, today, the Virgin gave birth to Ion. And this is also done in the city of Petra, and in the Arabic dialect, praising the Virgin, calling her Kori, that is, Virgin, and Dusaris, she gave birth to, that is, the Virgin's only son. And this also happens in Elusa, in the city, the same night, January 6th, as they're in Petra and Alexandria, Egypt. It turns out that both of these gods mentioned here, Ion and Dusaris, the former Greek, the latter Arabic, are gods who are closely connected and even identified with Dionysus by many of the contemporary sources. But it gets even deeper. 
the ancient Greeks had a Dionysian epiphany feast celebrated on the night of the 5th of January into the 6th of January. It was also a smaller feast that came roughly 12 days following a winter solstice festival known as Heloa or the rural Dionysia celebrated during the week of the winter solstice which was occurring on December 25th of the Julian calendar. This January 6th epiphany festival for Dionysus was also mentioned by Pliny the Younger in the early 2nd century so we can be certain that this this feast was around during the rise of early Christianity and was well known. According to Pliny, in the Temple of Dionysus at Andros, there is a fountain that tastes like wine every year on the 5th of January, a date called Theodosia. It is this exact same location, the Temple of Dionysus at Andros and Elis, that Pausanias, in his Geography of Greece, relates that jars are miraculously filled to the brim with wine by the god for his festival. Anna Isabel, Jimenez San Cristobal, writes extensively on this in a peer-reviewed article titled The Epiphany of Dionysus and Elis and the Miracle of Wine. Pausanias writes, the Elians worship Dionysus with the greatest reverence, and they assert that the god attends their festival. Three jars are brought into the building by the priests and set down empty in the presence of the citizens and of any strangers who may chance to be in the country. The doors of the building are sealed by the priests themselves and by any others who may be so inclined. On the morrow, they are allowed to examine the seals and on going into the building, they find the jars filled with wine. This means that not only are Jesus and Dionysus both turning water into wine, but they both have Epiphany Feast on January 6th, which in fact also venerates the wedding at Cana, a literal wine miracle story, as well as the legends about Dionysus making wine for this event. And on top of this, three major cities in the east, Alexandria, Eleusa, and Petra, all have similar epiphany feasts honoring other gods who are born of a virgin on the same day as Jesus, called Dusharis and Ion, who are both identified with Dionysus by several authors. Both Plotinus and Proclus assert that Ion is just another avatar of Dionysus, and the Byzantine Suda identifies Ion as a syncretic Osiris Adonis and Attis, which makes things even more tempting to say that the character of Christ in John's Gospel could be influenced by the same dying and rising agricultural paradigm. Jarl Fossum, who was the professor at Michigan University in a peer-reviewed article, wrote that Ion is a form of Osiris Dionysus, resurrected annually. His image was marked with crosses on his hands, knees, and forehead. Dr. Fossum lays out yet another parallel between the virgin-born Ion with Dionysus saying that Cori, the virgin, was a title for Persephone and was only mentioned giving birth to one god in hundreds of texts, myths, and fragments that mention her, and that is Zagreus, also called Sabasius by Diodorus, both being the firstborn Dionysus. 